And welcome to the station, Kentucky's conservative outpost for all things political and, and local and statewide. And, and we, we, we thank you for um, joining us this week. We're going to continue the theme that we touched on in the month of June, which is the LGBT movement and, and the things uh, related to it politically and culturally. And uh, we, we, I, this is now in July when we're filming this, but but I still think there's there's another aspect of this that we haven't covered that really needs to be touched on, and and uh, we have a guest with us today that can help help unpack this in a, in a way that's going to be very very helpful for folks. Um, so it's Richard Nelson with the, with the, let me go ahead and introduce Richard Richard Nelson with the Conway Policy uh, Conway Policy Center, and he's a founder and, and executive director, and uh, and you're you're doing a, a workshop on on the the LGBT push in public schools and culture and, and a, a Christian response. Right. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing how these workshops are going, some of your thoughts that you're sharing at these. And just because I think that's that's the core of this whole issue of the past 20 years is, is the is the church or, or the, the culture as a whole has not had the uh, sort of the the the, uh, the spiritual, the academic, the the um, the intellectual sort of response mm -hmm. to the the movement, uh, the LGBT movement, right. and, and it and so uh, and it's for lots of reasons, and we'll get into that. We also have uh, Bob Scott uh, with us via Skype, and our, our intrepid co-host that's here every week, and we we appreciate you being on the show, Bob, and mm -hmm. and uh, and and so so let, let's let's talk about this in in this sense, and I feel like that even when this issue first really got traction, in the, say, in the, in the 90s. I mean, it started way back in the... You want to go back to the beginning of the you know, the, the American experience with this. Go back to the Stonewall riots and go and go in, in the 70s and 80s and, you know, all, all through those. But really, the, the issue started getting uh, traction politically in this country in the 90s and then it, uh, up to the, the gay marriage... Um, uh, with the Supreme Court, uh, you know, legalized gay marriage um, across the, the U.S. And, and that, that sort of was a, a peak moment for that movement. And But prior to that, I mean, during that period, it seems like there was not a, a strong response from for Christians especially, but also just those are, that are more conservative and traditional in their worldview about sexuality, about these sort of issues, a strong response that, that really delved into the nature of what homosexuality and what what same-sex attraction, uh, what what all these um, gender dysphoria issues, all these mm -hmm. things that are wrapped up in the LGBT you know uh, label, mm -hmm. what, what are some of the the reasons behind these sort of um, you know, sort of sort of uh, you know, I'm trying to use the politically correct term here, but I shouldn't. Just what, why this? Why somebody has a same-sex attraction? Why somebody has this feeling that they want to be? A, they're born a man, but they want to be a woman. You know, yeah. um, the, we've sort of seeded that argument, and just and, and because we're afraid to engage, you know, and uh, for lots of reasons. And then we've so when you see that argument, then you the other side just says, well, hey. Doesn't matter. They either born that way, or this is their right to be this way, mm -hmm. and and so and so then it becomes a civil rights issue, right. which is very hard to fight because the America for the past 50, 70 years we've been dealing with civil rights as its number one, uh, you know, mode of, of addressing grievances, and so. Mm -hmm. um, but this is different. I mean, because yeah. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't believe you're born this way. I don't. Sure. I, believe, I think there are there are affectations and things that that can, that can affect uh, someone's. Uh, same-sex attractions, for example, and, and it's very complex, but it's mm -hmm. but it's there. There's no evidence that you're born this way, and and it, because even the um, you know the, the the movement itself has tried to find evidence. They, they've been politically motivated to find this evidence, mm -hmm. but it's not there. Any, any right. honest honest uh, person that looks at this uh, knows that this is not a. You know, but but it is deep-seated and it's hard. You know, so there's a lot of issues here. So yeah. let's talk about that from from that level and I'm really curious I guess first of all tell me about this workshop and some yeah. of the some of the ground that it covers because I think this if we can if we can take this issue and, and go back to the foundation of you know, why someone is this way then you can start there in an argument you yeah. can start there and and say first of all we disagree fundamentally on the nature of this so so because if yeah. I agree with the way with your worldview of why somebody is gay then sh I, I guess I need to line up politically with how th what you want done. Right. But see, I totally disagree with why somebody is gay. Yeah. And I think it's something that is that is not inherent to the person's being. 
that doesn't change your humanity. You just have a same-sex attraction. You're not a gay person like you are a black person. Right. You're just someone with the same-sex attraction, and there's a reason. There's a reason you have that same-sex attraction, yeah. and it's not because you were born that way. Yeah. And so let's we can unpack that. And that, that there's a lot of spiritual, emotional, psychological issues you have to you have to get into to to to, to deal with that. But it, and it's difficult, and we, we know that it's a difficult issue. So mm-hmm. so uh, so let's so that's why we, we brought in yeah. Richard. Yeah. He, he can he can tackle yeah. the yeah. difficult issues. So yeah. um, so yeah. Richard, to tell me about this workshop. Yeah, so, Tom. Yeah. First of all, thank you all for having me on the program. It's good to be here with you and to just be able to share a perspective that isn't widely shared in culture, where mainstream news outlets are not often open to a perspective like ours at the Kalmo Policy Center. And I don't think it's because we are um, uncaring or unkind, uh, but it's just because it is not used the term politically correct. The perception is, is if you have a different view on homosexuality and gender dysphoria, dysphoria, other than totally affirming those lifestyles, then you're viewed as hateful and bigoted. And we could spend some time going into why that is. But um, uh, uh, you asked about the workshops. So we are hosting a series of workshops across the state called the LGBT Push in Public Schools, A Christian Response. And these workshops are really a response to what the Kentucky Department of Education did last summer. It was one year ago when they issued uh, LGBT guidance for public schools and an LGBT toolkit for teachers to use in the classroom. And this was troubling in a number of regards. And just taking a step back, Tom, um, you'd mentioned rights where homosexuality and gender identity has been positioned in a term of in the terms of human rights. Yeah. That's one category, and that was achieved in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. But we're talking about a different category of what is being taught and promoted to our young children, mm. not just high schoolers anymore, but to very young children, uh, kindergartners, first and second graders. And that is where this um, push has really crossed a line. It's one thing for adults to discuss this issue and to debate over what is a right and what's the meaning of freedom. It's quite another issue when you're talking about what's being promoted in the public schools. As we record this program, we're in Louisville, and there is a school board here and a school district here that uh, I can unequivocally say they've embraced uh, this whole idea that it's affirming and welcoming and we want to create a safe and inclusive environment. And I really do believe that they think they're doing good for the kids. That's right. That's what they've right. not considered is what a parents say. Mm-hmm. They have not considered whether or not this is true. Uh, is it true that young children can determine their own gender identity? Is it true that all sexual choices are equally valid and equally lead to human flourishing? They're not answering those things. And not, we not. at the Commonwealth Policy Center are bringing in perspective, Tom, to teachers, administrators, concerned parents, helping them understand what this guidance means, helping them to understand the legislature's response to this guidance, and then giving them a blueprint or a path forward as to how to engage these issues as they come up in their public schools. That's beautiful, and it's so necessary, because it, it seems like you know the folks on the school board or, or, or uh, administrators that, that, that deal with this sort of issue, I think there's an assumption in the culture that this issue is settled of why someone is this way, or why, or whether or not it's a good thing that they they uh, they want to choose this lifestyle or choose this type of uh, gender dysphoria behavior. They, 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 they assume, there's an assumption that oh, this you know, that's okay, it's, and everybody should just agree with that, and, and it's and it's the moral thing to affirm and support that. And well, th- that's that's a false assumption. I, I don't think the the, the the controversy surrounding same-sex attraction has ever gone away you know people have deep-seated beliefs about that and they've been repressed a lot of their viewpoints and their willingness to talk about it publicly has been suppressed because of a heavy political movement that is a basically you know punished people who, who have challenged that 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 narrative and and so but it doesn't mean those those ideas and those deep-seated beliefs have gone away especially amongst parents who see their kids and as their kids not the state's kids and so it, it so this assumption needs to be challenged but it has to be challenged in a way that's that thought that's thoughtful and, and, and kind of that responds in a way that really understands the issue more than just
just, oh, I'm just icked out about, oh, oh, this icky gay people. Oh, yeah. oh, the, yeah. just the thought of this going on, this person dressing up. Oh, there's a natural sort of impulse of wanting to reject that because if you have sort of a, a, a healthy, normative, you know, heterosexual sort of uh, view of the world, then it just the opposite of that is there's sort of a shock to your system. Uh, but mature adults can can deal with that and discuss it. But, but when you start dealing with pressing that onto your onto your children and in school systems, just assuming that this is normal and this is the way we should teach it. And it, well, you, you get my point. Yeah. It's yeah. And that's a good point. And and to to that point in particular, uh, it disregards what parents think is appropriate for kids. It right. disregards parental input, parental rights into this conversation. That's I right. think we've gotten to a point, Tom, where as a society we can agree that it's inappropriate to bring in inappropriate material, age inappropriate material to young kids, kindergartners, first, second, third graders, and that's precisely what the Kentucky Department of Education did with their LGBT toolkit last year. They were encouraging uh, GLSEN curriculum um, part of the one of the one of the curriculums was the gingerbread person now it's a picture of the gender uh, gingerbread man mm -hmm. and it pointed out to where your feelings come from pointed out to the heart where your sexual organs are pointed to those places on the gingerbread man and um, this was meant not for high school students but for very young children and this is where the line was crossed by the Kentucky Department of Education the state legislature responded with Senate Bill 150 and they pushed back and they said, look, no sex ed in K through five classrooms, no gender ideology or sexual orientation curriculum in sixth through 12th grades, no gender preferred pronouns uh, in the schools where teachers are forced to use those pronouns and no more keeping it hidden from parents. Uh, these are a few things that the state legislature did to hit the reset button, to shore up conscience rights for teachers and then also to um, uh, short parental rights. Uh, par parents have huge say and really have the ultimate say the over ultimate what say. their kids are yeah. going to be exposed to in kids. the classrooms mm -hmm. and what they should learn. Mm -hmm. Tom, I want to read you something sure. from this LGBT guidance. Now, it has since been revised, but much of it is still in place. I want to say this at the outset, that I think many people in the Department of Education really believe that they're helping kids. Mm. The, the first uh, line here um, and what I'm looking at in their guidance says, considerations for building safe and supportive schools for LGBT students. They acknowledge that often these students are marginalized, they're hurt, they don't have supportive family uh, environments that they come from. So I think the motive is there. It just, they're coming from a very different worldview and again, neglecting what is age appropriate, neglecting parental rights. Um, one of the things that they say is this in a situation where a student wishes to use different pronouns and i'm quoting directly or a different name than the parents wish for their school to use it puts the school at an extreme disadvantage of becoming the goal between for some very challenging issues with this in mind a school presented with this situation should consider the following factors the student's request is the first one second one is the student's safety and i'm not going into all of this and then the parents desires is the third one and then they go on to say this parents are afforded wide latitude to determine the educational path of their children i just want to dwell on that language for a moment parents are given really more than wider latitude that's right yeah they are uh they they are charged and they have the right to direct the upbringing and the education of their of their child um, once they give their child to the state or uh, let the, they're not giving the child to the state, <laughs> they are letting their kid uh, go. Attend their, public their kid schools. Attend yeah. the public schools. Yeah, right. Um, but they're trusting the public school again, and that's a huge trust that this policy breaches. It goes on to say, as far as the gender preferred pronoun, in short, the student's request should be honored by the school. And we're talking about their request to use a gender preferred pronoun. If they're a biological male that's identifying with she, her pronouns, then the teacher has to honor that request. That's what this guidance is saying. To do otherwise 
would likely lead to a Title IX violation due to the actions that would accompany failing to acknowledge yeah. the student's stated gender identity. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's where I get concerned about the future of public schools. I, I don't think we can have a public school system if we can't agree on these fundamental mm -hmm. uh, topics like uh, is a boy a boy or a girl a girl, you know, and, and how we address those children in the class. If we can't agree on that, I think we need to just dissolve the public school system. That's a sh that's another show we can talk about. But I just, you know, that we're we're disagreeing at such fundamental levels. Well, well, it's it's like 1858, and we, it's either you, can, you only live. We can either go on as a free country or a slave country. We can't be both, you know. And it's like you you can either be, you know, LGBT schools or or not. You can't go on both get both ways. And it's just. If you want to press on that a little bit, yeah. let's talk about science. I mean, the science says that there's male or female. There are two genders. You have an XX chromosome, which means you're female, or an XY chromosome, which means you're male. That's science, and that's part of what public schools should be teaching. How about grammar? Right. Uh, if there is a, a, a biological female, you use the grammar she, her pronouns. Yeah. If there's a biological male, it's the he, him pronoun, pronouns. That's right. Um, these are just... the. You, to your point about not being able to, uh, there needs to be a common understanding, yeah. Tom, yeah. of what is male, what is female, right. what is science, what is truth. If I could touch on something sure. earlier, you brought sure. up in the opening statement mm -hmm. about why are we here? Um, you know, is homosexuality innate and inborn? Is it genetic? Um, how do we get to the point where we've gotten? And I would say it's largely because the church Christians have been absent from discussions over the last several decades. We've right. not been involved with culture. We've not been at the table, whether it's the school board or state legislatures or in Congress, uh, engaging these issues from a biblical worldview. When we have gotten involved, if we have, often it is we've come across as heavy handed, right. preachy. Um, wrong motives, right. uh, wrong attitude, yeah. and the world feels like they're being preached at. The perspective that we take when we engage issues, we want to engage um, according to God's truth. Of course, that's the foundation for how we engage, but we, we speak the truth and we do it in love. Another thing, Tom, is we seek the welfare of the city. I think of Jeremiah 29, where Jeremiah is writing this letter to the exiles in Babylon and he says look seek the welfare of the city for in its welfare you will find yours yeah. so if we come across as caring about our community caring for those on the other side of an issue and being respectful to them and truly bringing our best arguments to the table I think we can be doing much better and we Absolutely. are we have yeah. in the last decade or so that's right but it's so important that we have we 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 speak with love with grace have the right motives in mind and we're truly seeking the welfare of the city that's as well. exactly right yeah and, and, and it's been such a just just a challenge to, to deal with this movement uh, on and in, in, in several ways one being that initially it was just pre presented as oh, we just want you to tolerate the, the this this lifestyle you just just tolerate it. Okay. Okay. Now we want you to change the definition of marriage, but just they're just going to, well, we'll just, people yeah. will get married and yeah. you, uh, people you know, can live the way they want to live. So now it's no longer that. It's you must celebrate this movement. Right. You must wave that pride flag or, or you will be uh, ostracized or canceled. And you must start using pronouns. Right. And so it's, you know, and those that have been in this issue early on, we understood that, that the slippery slope for this sort of thing is that it, it turns into an authoritarian system after a while where you have, where it's, where they enforce compliance because it's, it's such a radical thing against nature to kind of push this. You almost have to have this heavy-handed approach for it to even succeed for a while. And so, so that we're dealing with that. We're dealing with people that are generally good-natured in this country, Christians that are good-natured, and okay, well, you know, they disagree with us. If they want to live that way, go. That we love them. We we, we think it's a sin, but we're not going to. We want. We don't want them to get fired or get kicked out of a restaurant. You know, we get that. You know, and and so we're. But it's they've moved beyond that. They, they, they've moved the fence too far. And let me bring in Bob real quick on a thought too, because um, you mentioned this, uh, Richard. You know. You, the science of, of this and mm -hmm. and uh, I feel like our our side of this has the science on our side I mean when, when you look at what a what a male or a female is I mean it's pretty clear biologically there's chromosomes that, that, that define that and uh, 
but and then this past week uh, there's a uh, been a controversy that's that's developed at Brown University, which is one of the you know larger universities in this country, one of the, I think in the Ivy League, yeah. and uh, they had a survey uh, a study done within the within the uh, university. I can pull this up on the screen if you want there, Will. Uh, so the question is, um, over 40 percent of Brown University students are now identifying as LGBTQ. Hmm. Now you cannot say that. 40% of those kids were born that way, or, or we've always had 40% of the kids that have gone to universities like that that have been that way that just suppressed their, their. No, th this we're in a moment now where this is a social contagion. You know, this is not just uh, I've always felt this way and I'm just finally coming out. No, this is now it is a trendy thing, and and, and, I, and I've, I've sort of these ideas have kind of washed through my mind and my soul and my and I, I now have I'm kind of captivated with the thought of this stuff and it's becoming a, a something that is now celebrated it's it's and, and the school systems by trying to do what they think is noble like you said they're trying to protect mm -hmm. what they think are oppressed LGBT students or whatever mm -hmm. just them doing is is introducing these ideas to 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 young people and then they have the culture supporting it as well. And so, yeah, we're now on a contagion stage, you know, and, and, and sexuality can be very suggestible, especially to, let me, this may be controversial, yes. but especially to women, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. And men, the studies have shown that homosexuality, same-sex attraction, a little more fixed, a little more difficult to kind of move left or right on that. Women can come out of that very easily. And if they're in a situation where it's very uh, popular suddenly to be bisexual or 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 or, or to go kiss a girl at a, at a party, mm -hmm. uh, it it can be very easily done. And 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 you see this with well, celebrities that have uh, one you know one one day they're they're dating or married to this to to a woman next they they get rid of that relationship they're back to a man you know they're very fluid on, on, and so mm -hmm. you deal with a lot of suggestible ideas and and. Uh, we're now, in a, and you can see this now, we're in a social contagion. And the science, back to my point, the science is showing this. And this this, this uh, study is very controversial. And the Brown University is trying to repress it. They're actually trying to push these professors out that have done this work. But it's just, it's hard science. And so, so anyway. Yeah. Bob, what, what are your thoughts on that? We, we've, we've talked for half an hour. I haven't brought you in yet. No, that's good. <laughs> I, and I was just thinking slippery meat slope, you know. Mm -hmm. um, exactly uh what has happened and uh you it's being made out to be um I I if you fall in line with with what they're speaking to be the cool thing you yeah. know and, and if you try to push back against it in any way then then you're you're immediately ostracized and uh thought of in a very negative light and uh the problem is uh and what our legislature did do is is basically say why are we even having this discussion with with uh, kindergartners and and, and young children? Uh, gosh, you know it hasn't been that long ago that all of us were, were going and growing up and, and and you know going through kindergarten and elementary school and junior high and um, I can't tell you the times. I'm not saying that any kind of sexual uh, conversation didn't happen. But it was very infrequent, you know, right. that it happened. Now uh, we live in a, a hypersexualized culture, a hypersexualized nation, uh, to where it's constantly being thrown out. And uh, you know, the bottom line is our, our nation, and we've talked about this many times, needs to come back. There needs to be a revival. They, they need to come back to God, you know. Right. And, and, make him the center and, and, and again that's another show and another discussion but when, when we started kicking god out out of the classroom uh that's when these far uh left reaching ideas have started to, to not just creep in come running in uh and and that's where we're finding ourselves right now as as a nation and as as a culture and uh some changes absolutely need to be made and and then praise god our our uh, state legislature had the courage to do what they did but even at that Richard could tell you because he he has uh, I believe Richard has interviewed uh, Jason Glass several times um, and uh, he's he's even pushing back against the the law yeah. you know um, and and that's concerning to me too you know that, that, that you have uh, 
someone who is in the position that he's in uh, with the Department of Education, the, the leader of the D Department of Education, and saying, well, this is going to end up potentially in court and uh, you know, with the support of the ACLU. Uh, I'm concerned about that. Uh, what do you feel about that, Richard? Yeah, no, that's a good point. I'm, I'm concerned that you have a Department of Education that's become extremely politicized. And not just politicized, but you have the state's largest school district, JCPS, Jefferson County Public Schools, where uh, an open records request found that teachers helped to organize the protest of Senate Bill 150. Uh, they helped secure the bus, lunches, uh, the whole itinerary for the day. Uh, teachers should not be involved with politically activating their classrooms, right. especially on issues like this, controversial issues. Gender ideology has no place in the public school K through 12 classroom. Teachers have no place, in my opinion, uh, garnering political activists in the classroom. And then our Department of Education. Look, Kentucky is lagging behind other states when it comes to educational performance. Uh, the Annie E. Casey Foundation just recently reported that, reported that our fourth graders, close to 70% of our fourth graders are reading behind grade level. About the same number of eighth graders are performing uh, way behind other states in math performance. Kentucky schools need to focus on basics, educating our kids, not with gender ideology, not with political activism. They need to, and I've said this all along, they need to be respectful of parental rights. They need to bring parents in on the um, curriculum decision process, open the school board meetings up, invite parents to participate. And I would uh, go out to say, uh, and this is not going out on a limb too far, most parents do not want this kind of stuff they, taught. They really don't. They want bathrooms yeah. that correspond to the biological sex of uh, the students. They don't want boys who identify as girls in the girls' locker rooms. And most parents, quite frankly, I think would support Senate Bill 150. Yeah. That was the bill that addressed all of these things I mentioned, and it went further. It said that there will be no hormone therapy or sex mutilation surgery of minors. So um, yeah. that we have to say these things and put it on the books is telling of where we are in our culture. The reason why we're, we are where we are is yeah. when there is a vacuum in the public arena, when there is no uh, moral center, um, then, then people will do what they want to do. The church has retreated right. um, from engaging the culture, mm -hmm. from speaking to the issues. Yeah. We just had a, a meeting just a little while ago before I came on the set with you with a group of pastors and we talked about speaking to gender dysphoria and LGBT identities and many pastors are not doing that. Some are, yeah. but by and large, they're not discipling their people how to think. Do, now, do, do you feel like they're just not equipped for that or they're unwilling to do it or maybe they are um, somehow swayed by the argument of the LGBT movement? I mean, what, what, what is that? I what, think what's there's the fear. I think there's fear to speak to this. They don't want to be labeled. They don't want to be criticized. I think there is uncertainty of how do I approach this issue? I know I've got some family members here in my church that have kids who are LGBT. Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, I, the, the, what I would recommend to them is, first of all, s realize if God's word speaks to something, a pastor needs to speak to yeah. something. Uh, if this issue is in their church, then be prepared to deal with it, but deal with it sensitively. Uh, and then ultimately, we've got to ask, who are we trying to please? Are we trying to, as, as a pastor, are we trying to please the congregation? Or do we have an audience of one, the That's creator right. of the universe, who gives us his guidebook for life? And That's he tells right. us how to flourish and what it means to have healthy human sexuality. Is he the one that we're trying to, to please and to honor? And when a pastor uh, asks those questions and, and is, uh, understands that Scripture speaks authoritatively, understands their role in discipling the people there, um, and then truly wants to honor God, I think then we begin to see this change. We see pastors that uh, have the courage to speak to these issues. We have congregations that are truly being discipled to think through these issues. And then we also have churches that are willing to engage this issue in the culture. And to Bob's point, we need, uh, Bob made the point earlier that we need a revival. We need an awakening. What the legislature did regarding Senate Bill 150 was a good first step. Uh, what uh, Daniel Cameron did with his opinion supporting Senate Bill 150, some of the Supreme Court or uh, federal court rulings supporting that, those are good. 
but we need people to stand. We yeah. need people to get out into the culture, attend yes. the school board meetings. Parents, go and meet with your teacher and find out what they're teaching in the classroom. Share your opinion and your perspective with them. Um, we need people to engage. If we don't engage and stand, the legislation and judicial rulings, uh, other efforts that are out there will merely be a shell. Mm -hmm. We need people to get behind these good laws and good court rulings and good opinions that our attorney general has made and um, be the support to uphold these laws um, that have uh, been put forth for us. Yeah, and, and it seems like we're at this moment too where if you are a pastor or you are a Christian leader or, or a Christian, and if you were somehow intimidated by this topic uh, prior to, to, to now, I take courage in this sense. I, I think politically, and I, I'm, I'm pretty good at reading the tea leaves of the culture and where we're at right now. I think we're, there's a moment right now where I think the, the, this movement, this LGBT plus whatever you want to call it, do the alphabet, you know, you have to add 15 letters to that to make it, you know, and, and by the way, all those letters don't agree with each other now. Now they're, they're actually coming at each other now. The, you know, the lesbians <laughs> don't like the bisexuals and the transgenders and it's becoming a big, you know, so that movement's about it. But there's a moment now where I think they've yep. hit sort of peak, peak LGBT movement. And, and so, so the culture, even those that are maybe not inclined to think from a biblical worldview, they're now, I think, disturbed enough by the excesses of that movement well, you're not going to see this immediate reaction of wanting to cancel or, or, or respond or just point point uh, fingers that, hey, you are a homophobe or you are a hater because that movement has really shown its cards for what it is. It's it's really at the, at the heart a kind of an aggressive movement against those that are uh, that might have a question about their, that movement. So it, now's a good time to really understand the, the nature of this and to start bringing up uh, a good response to this biblically and, and intellectually and thoughtfully and with love, like you said, because listen, folks that are caught up in this stuff, they're, they're precious people, mm -hmm. precious right. people that are, that are caught up in this lifestyle and, and, uh, and you want to, you want to help, you want to love. I mean, because uh, I grew up in the church. I'm in my early 50s, right? So, and um, I remember back in the 80s when, when a lot of these things were being discussed, and we would have some some folks that that would uh, show, uh, you know, the, the pride parades, you know, from San Francisco in the 80s. I remember watching this on video. So, see this? See this movement? They're they're a bunch of crazies. They want to do this to your kids, and look how evil they are, and how disgusting that is, and and it was a it was a sort of rea a reaction to that movement from a from a uh, almost a, like I said an, a not a sympathetic and loving reaction at, at, at times. I mean, you should be repulsed by a lot of that stuff. You, they're still doing this now. I mean, th these these pride parades that that kind of celebrated or started in the San Francisco scene uh, 80, 40 years ago are now in every city, and, and they're and, and they're being encouraged well, to bring your ch your kids to it as well. And so you should be repressed by uh, repulsed by that. Let me finish this point, Bob. You should be repulsed by that, but we need to to express this in a way uh, in a winsome way that shows that we love these folks that are involved in that, but you still have to draw a line to protect your children and be have a righteous anger about the excesses of that movement. It's a real, it's a tough balance for Christians to strike and we get it, but we gotta fight that battle, you know? And, and like you said, we answer to one here. Right. This isn't the culture. We answer, we will all answer how we, how we come down on this. And that movement is forcing all of us to make a decision on where they stand. Mm -hmm. You can't just yeah. ignore this anymore. Right. It's coming to you. It's coming to your HR department. It's coming to your, uh, to, to the people, to the LGBT movement that's going down the street to talking to every business and knocking on the door and saying, hey, it's, it's Pride Month. Uh, everybody else is hanging up their Pride flag. Are you going to do the Pride flag? Oh, you're not? Oh, well, we've got a Facebook page that's going to tell everybody about what you do. And so you, everybody's confronted by this now. You, you cannot hide from this. So you might as well just stand up for what's true and right, because at the end of the day, that's only going to that's going to win out anyway. I'm sorry, Bob. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, yeah, I, you said it beautifully, and and uh, I'm sure everybody has seen uh, in some cities where you you will have usually mainly men uh, in parades, and, and now they've taken it a step further where where they're really basically completely naked yeah. uh, in the parade, and and uh, with young children and people around uh you know for all the world to see and and again that's the problem it's it's 
give an inch, they've taken a mile, you know, as far right. as the nutrition is concerned. So uh, you're right, Tom and uh, Richard, it, it's it's time to take a stand, you know, and, and uh, uh, either show up or shut up. Uh, and if you shut up, you're going to be sorry. Uh, we're already seeing the ramifications of that. Uh, you need to actively engage in love uh, with your school boards, your church. Uh, you talk to your deacons, your elders, your, your, your pastors. And go uh, to this workshop and go to this workshop right. and learn. Well, I, I, learn I, I, I wanted to bring I that in. I can't think of anything better to go to. Than, uh, you know, yeah. uh, there's no one that does it. You know, I said it before we got on the air, better than Richard Nelson, the Commonwealth Policy Center. Uh, with regard to uh, addressing these very, very difficult topics. Uh, Richard has for years, this, this isn't a recent thing for him, actively engaged um, you know, the other side uh, in loving, open, common discussions. And usually the other side's not real loving to him right. uh, in, in that, that, that process, but he comes across in, in a very professional, loving way uh, and, and stating facts. And that's something that they seem to really not like, you know, when, when he does that. Yeah, Will, can you put, put this up on the screen? This is the, uh, the, the website to, to, you know, about where, where these workshops are going to be held. There's, um, the, the next one is in LaGrange. So if you're watching on WBNA Channel 21, and it's, uh, this airs before July 29th, um, and it should, uh, it's right here in, in the grain, so go go check it out. And uh, what what time is it? Is you know eight, 8, 8 a.m. to eleven? Eight thirty in okay. the morning. Yeah. Actually, eight a.m. Uh, breakfast. Eight thirty. It's going to start. It'll be done by eleven thirty. And okay. uh, July the 29th in the grain. Is that a Saturday? Or it's is a Saturday, Saturday morning. Okay, very um, good. In our okay. target group, Tom, is uh, we want Christian public school teachers, Christian uh, principals, and administrators, and then also parents of uh, public school students. Mm. Pastors are welcome to come as well. I think they will be impressed. Of course, we're trying to and equip even them. Even the layperson as well, not just not just the, okay, right? They're 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 welcome. All welcome to yeah. come. We're trying to equip them to think biblically about this issue and what's going on in the public schools, and to give them a roadmap as to how to respond in a way that honors God. One thing that I think attendees will find uh, refreshing here is that our tone and our motivation of approach is is different than we've often seen. First of our uh, of all our tone is uh, where we lead with grace we land on truth it's based off of um, mm -hmm. ephesians 4 15 we're to speak the truth in love uh, colossians 4 6 to let your speech be gracious seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone we take a grace-based approach as we engage these issues and as i alluded to earlier tom the motivation here is that we are truly seeking the well-being of students who are struggling with gender dysphoria and LGBT identities. We are truly um, trying to help the teachers to live according to their conscience in the classrooms. Um, and we are seeking the good of the city. It's the good of people, in this case, children and teachers, and then the good of the community. Um, so our motivation is different than some of the other approaches that have been taken on this issue. We've done three of these workshops across the state. We've got five more scheduled, and we'd love for the viewers to attend. They just simply have to go to our website, commonwealthpolicycenter.org, and at the very top of that homepage, they can uh, register, click on the uh, digital flyer. It says LGBT push in the public schools and culture, a Christian response. Click on that flyer and then a drop down box will appear and they can register to attend. Tremendous. Do you deal with in any workshop, uh, workshop the um, sort of the, uh, the, the, the nature of these sort of uh, issues you know, from, a, from a spiritual and psychological? So, so what, why, does, why is somebody gay, you know, or why does somebody have a gender dysphoria uh, you know, moment? Uh, I'm curious, do you get into those issues? Because I feel like we, we haven't, and, and, uh, and, and the people are not armed on how to respond to that. And, yeah. and so... Um, well, we don't really go into the science or the psychology as to why somebody embraces that. We do know that there is a um, young people today more than ever are affected with gender dysphoria. I've heard of some that one term I've heard from one author, they've called it a social contagion, um, where it's heavily influenced uh, largely teen girls in mm -hmm. middle school. Mm -hmm. um, one that identifies with the opposite sex and then you see a whole peer group mm -hmm. that's friends with that girl that all of a sudden they're transgender. Mm -hmm. um, we really don't go into the details of what's happening there. We go into more of the response of how we as Christians can 
um, walk through this issue and think through this issue and respond well. I'm convinced that it's our lack of response, our lack of showing up at the school board meetings or sharing with uh, teachers, here's what we think is right and true and good. It's our silence that has more than anything um, that has, has allowed the other side to set the agenda, to determine the tone, and to be the gatekeepers for discussion. That's why in the beginning I was grateful to you, said that I was, appreciate you having me on to talk about this on, uh, on, on TV uh, 21 here. Absolutely, so. yeah, and we thank you for doing this work because it's, it's uh, so needed. So, uh, well, this is great. Well, we're gonna wrap the show up. Uh, Richard, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for the effort. Uh, people are already calling and want to sign up. I guess. That's right. <laughs> I'll be available after <laughs> That's the program. Right. That's right. A, yeah. So, Bob, well, th thanks. Uh, you have any last uh, thoughts there, Bob, you want to add? Or, or? No, I, I you summed it up beautifully. Uh, and again, the, the key word is engage, get involved. No. That's it. That's right. Yeah. And because uh, you will be one way or the other, you might as well do it on your own or because right. you're going to be involved in this one way or the other, especially if you have kids, because uh, they're they're dealing with this issue every day now in school and either through their peer group or through the school system itself. And uh, unfortunately, so so please get get uh, armed and uh, and don't don't shirk back from what you know is right in your heart. You know what's right. You know, you know, a young child was born the sex they were born, and they're and they're they're that they're supposed to be that way. And that's, and, and when they veer from that, it's not because it's a healthy lifestyle choice, or we all, no, they, we all know that's there's something going on wrong. And and and, and but you better keep them from doing anything that's a surgery or or, or uh, oh, oh, you're 13 and you want to you're you think you're a girl now, so you want to. Okay, uh, that's irreversible, folks. <laughs> that, that is, that's to the point where if you allow that to happen, or if we allow that to happen as a culture, that should be a human rights abuse. We ought to, mm -hmm. we ought to just uh, be in criminal, be in jail for that. So, anyway, so that's where this stuff's going. Um, anyway, thanks for joining the, the program. You're watching the station, Kentucky's Conservative Outpost, and we're pretty unafraid to tackle these issues. Not a lot of people will, and so, uh, so we're we're out there, you know, talking about this stuff. We, so we hope you. Uh, Hope you get something out of it. Please support the Common Policy Institute. Please support us. Please, please go to the uh, workshop and follow us on Facebook and, and the internet and all, all places where you can follow us. See you next week.